thank you very much. My name is Perry Correll. I think most of you know me by now. Um, originally, this presentation was going to be about 30 minutes long. It was going to be about Wi-Fi um, Alliance overview and also get into the security stuff, WP2 and Advanced, WPA3, Easy Connect and Enhanced Open. I think we kind of talked through that enough. So this is going to be an overview of the Wi-Fi Alliance, what they're all about, how you guys could possibly be involved if you want to. One of, one of the things over the last <laughs> two days, three days, I've heard a lot of people say, why doesn't Wi-Fi Alliance do this? Or Wi-Fi Alliance do that? Or whatever. It's important to understand who the Wi-Fi Alliance is. It's really a cooperative, a collection of different companies. And the whole idea is global um, collaboration. So it's about 800 companies. And these are um, connectivity providers. These are silicon providers. These are device providers. These are server providers. And they do all these different things. They all get together. And in order to get anything done, they have to agree on things. So there's a lot of different task groups. There's 11AX marketing task group. There's 11AX technical task group. There's um, a security marketing task group and a technical task group. And all these people get together live at some times and on conference calls, and they make decisions on things. So when you say, you know, why didn't the Wi-Fi Alliance do this? They, in many ways, don't even get a vote. It's the people that form these committees that vote on these. So when, when they decide that WPA3 would be a requirement for 11AX, it wasn't some guy in the Wi-Fi Alliance said, hey, that's a good idea. It's the guys in these task groups that voted on this. And some of that time, that stuff gets very emotional and all that. And it's important to understand what's going on. And in these environments, you know, a lot of times we, we talk about things, well, God, this would be a really neat idea if they did this. And it's really easy to say that if you don't have any skin in the game. If you're not making that client, if you're not making that application, if you're not making that device, and a bunch of 20 other people saying, you got to support this functionality. So i got to spend engineering and resource time and all that stuff to make this work. And so once again, that's a challenge. So it's very, very important to understand that it's not the Wi-Fi Alliance, some guy sitting somewhere behind a big desk making these great decisions. It's the member organizations that are there that are voting on this stuff. And sometimes it's very contentious. Sometimes it goes on. There's lots of debates back and forth. You know, WPA3 had lots of issues. 11AK still, or 11AX um, is still going through some stuff. And we hear a lot of Wi-Fi Alliance around Phi and Mac stuff, 802.11a, b, g, n, and a, c, and a, x, and the security. But there's a lot of other stuff going on that you, you just sometimes just think about. Because their goal is just about connecting everybody, one vision, everything, every time, and all that. But they're about interoperability, and it's important to understand that. You know, WPA3 is kind of a little bit of a standard, but most of the time it's like, you know, IEEE 11AX came out. Let's make sure that anybody says they have an 11AX device and it's Wi Fi Alliance stamped, that they all can work together. So they have a lot of interoperability tests, something that they call plug fests that go on all the time. Let me know when my time is up because I didn't kind of keep track of that. So it's important to understand what's going on with this is that it's probably one of the greatest success stories. There's about 9 billion Wi-Fi devices out there. Anybody know how many people there are on Earth? About seven, seven and a half billion, give or take a little bit. So, you know, probably the reason the difference of that is probably most of the people in this room who have 10, 12, 14 devices of their own. Some of you probably got six on you right now. I mean, that's kind of the way it works. And three billion new shipments every year. Once again, that's why I'm real excited about 11AX, because that'll turn over pretty quick and we'll go that way. Nonstop innovation, um, prime, primary medium for global internet traffic. It's past everything else. More than 50% of traffic is going over Wi-Fi, and probably a lot more than that in some environments. This is something that was just kind of a, the Wi-Fi Alliance announced this, this just kind of the other day. Some of the numbers that came out, uh, the total Wi-Fi value, we talk about this stuff. You know, $2 trillion worth of value as far as Wi-Fi, and that's going to double significantly in a very short period of time. So obviously, there's, there's a lot of things involved here and a lot of things going on. The Wi-Fi Alliance also gets involved with a lot of other things, and they're advocates for Wi-Fi and for the unlicensed spectrum. So if you're from the States like I am, uh, they recently pushed and were able to get a Wi-Fi caucus within our Congress. So we got a couple of congressmen now that part of their role is kind of to, to push the, the advantages of Wi-Fi, obviously the FCC and everything else, which is pretty cool because we've had like a bicycle caucus for like 30 years. Now we finally just got a Wi-Fi caucus, which I think is a little bit more important. <laughs> They're also helping along uh, recently, you've heard about later this month is going to be uh, the, the FCC is doing some uh, investigation into the, the six gigahertz space, so they're involved in that. And they're also involved regionally, so ETSI and other type stuff. So they're, they're advocates for pushing the unlicensed ban, the Wi-Fi ban, and all that. 
The other important thing about it is understanding the programs. Now, hopefully I can do this. I'm going to kind of shift to a different screen, and hopefully you'll see this. A lot of times it doesn't work as well. So can you, no, you see my surfing dog. Why can't I see my Wi-Fi? Ah. It's invisible. No. OK, well, it, I'll go back to where it was. I didn't think this was going to work this uh, quick. So um, the, the, the issue is kind of to understand, um, over the last few days, we've heard a lot of people talk about a lot of different things. You mentioned roaming a couple times. Wi-Fi Alliance has, Alliance has a certification program called Optimized Connectivity. And it talks about fast link, uh, initial setup type functionality and roaming and leveraging KVR and all this stuff. And it's a lot of good information that will deal exactly with that. We had discussions about um, um, Voicera and voice. There's a couple of this. There's a voice personal. There's a voice um, enterprise. Standard. There's also a work group within the Wi-Fi Alliance. It's just about healthcare. You know, what are best practices? And so they try to keep track of what's happening with other standards and try to direct them one way or another. That group isn't actually writing, stand, uh, writing certifications, but they're trying to keep an eye on what they can kind of push for with these other standard organizations to help in the healthcare. There's another one for automotive. There's another one for operators. And so there's a lot of different work groups that you ought to think about getting involved with. Obviously, most people think only vendors get involved with. But there's also service providers and others. Obviously, it costs a couple dollars to get involved with that. There's, there's roaming type function. Who's, who's the guy with the, uh, the German angst? Renee, there. there. There's actually a work group in there about um, how to design Wi-Fi for residential homes and MTUs and MDUs, so maybe people will get a little bit more comfortable. There's a certification on how I should design new buildings to support Wi-Fi. So they are doing a lot of things along this, as I said, roaming and healthcare and all these different organizations. So it's very important to understand what they do. But when they do this functionality, you know, certified connectivity, Wi-Fi aware. Who cares about IoT? We got Wi-Fi aware. You guys are all real smart, right? I bet you there's at least one person in this room that doesn't know that I don't need an AP to do Wi-Fi. That Wi-Fi devices can talk to themselves. If you're real old and got gray hair like me, you used to call it ad hoc. If you're a little bit less old, you can call it Wi-Fi direct. Now you can call it Wi-Fi aware. It's trying to steal a little thunder from the IoT world where I can actually set up groups and let devices communicate to each other. Like kind of like doing BLE, but I actually explain real information, not just tell you what to do. So neat things coming on down there. Go to the uh, Wi-Fi Alliance website, go under certifications, go under programs, and it lists all the programs and it gives you real technical information. It's not just a bunch of marketing stuff that you're not interested in seeing. You've got 15, 20 pages page documents that get deep dive into the technical that's available for you guys that you don't have to sign in or register or pay any money for that explain like, has anybody heard of FILS? Fast initial link setup. How to do that quicker. How to set it up. How to eliminate some packets. How to actually use KVR. You know, different things you can do. Problem is that you've got to push for those standards. You can't just say Wi-Fi Alliance ought to certify that everybody has to do this as of two years from now. The groups have to get together and say, hey, it's a good idea. We really want to push for this. You negotiate. You go back and forth just like any other type of environment. So once again, a lot of different groups here. But take a look and see what the others. You know, Wi-Fi certified Vantage, which kind of wraps up Passpoint. Uh, Agile mobile band. Uh, Agile multiband. How do I seamlessly roam from 2.4 to 5 to maybe 60? You know, because we're going to have those environments that we need to deal with. So it's important to understand what they do and what their responsibilities are. As I said, in as far as the, um, the security side, obviously this is a continuing process. WPA2 is going to be supported. It's going to be improved. The different functionalities will come along. They, it's not just going to die and everything's going to be focused on WPA3. Because as I said, WPA2 is going to be around for the rest of my life. I mean, there's people out here, got, we mentioned yesterday, 11B, and it probably does WEP. You know, but if it's a scanner in a warehouse, I'm not going to throw away because it works. So you have to do other things. That's why you get the big bucks. You separate that stuff out. So it's a continual thing. Once again, WPA3 is next generation. It's a, it's a step up. It's improvement. It's making it more secure. I hate to say this, but it allows you to use dumber passwords. But uh, it, it really does. So now you can go back to using cat. I'm sorry I didn't say that. But the idea is I can't capture it and do an offline dictionary. Still use those dumb things. Who, who's, a, who's the Unix people from way back? You should use unprintable characters. You have backspace as part of your um, password. No, nobody ever guessed that. But once again, some cool things, but WPA3, will there be a WPA4 someday? Probably. And, but you'll actually probably see WPA3 improvements over the next couple of years. That th maybe some of the stuff that you thought should have been in it last year 
might show, or this year, might show up again. It's a continual process. Once again, a bunch of people get in a room, yell, scream, carry on, cry a little bit, and then we kind of move forward. I hope the Wi-Fi alliance doesn't see this. Um, <laughs> it's going to continue. Once again, we saw the growth. The biggest concern people have right now is security, uh, especially when you get into public venues, especially when you get into hospitality. They're more and more concerned about that, but they got to balance that. My grandmother's showing up. She has to be able to get on the network. And if she calls a help desk, that's not going to work. So it's going to be open or an easier, simpler way. You know, enhanced open actually fits in that area. So the different things, WPA3 personal, WPA enterprise, WPA3 personal was really the focus with the current year. You're probably going to see improvements, as Philip mentioned, um, coming in the, the near future in, in enterprise. It's going to be a continually evolving functionality. Um, once again, we kind of talk about easy connects, a secure way to get out of your network. Is it very, very high, robust security? No, but it's better than we have now. Give you some extra tools. That, that I used to work for a company, and we had a guy. He was a security guy, and his whole thing, this was the Ethernet days, by the way. He had a thing on his wall, best security tools, a pair of wire cutters. You know, if you want to be secure, don't connect to anything. Turn off your USB ports. Turn off all, you know, get rid of the floppy disk drives, to those of you who know what a floppy disk drive is. The whole idea is as soon as you connect to something, you open yourself up to something. And that's just what, how much, what level of security you're willing to risk. It's the old peeling the onion type thing. There's always going to be some level of threat. As I said before, with, uh, with an authenticator, I can onboard an access point, then I can onboard the individual devices, and the devices in the access point can link up using a connector, using a secure type of environment. So once again, it's actually very, very secure. You're going to see it much more in the IoT environment than anywhere else. Better protection and hand -ups open. We kind of talked about this. Do elliptic curve Diffie Hillman. Only Philip knows that. He's the only guy who ever explained it to me. So, so new introduction to stuff. It's going to continue to evolve as we're going over time. Obviously, security is a big thing. The big Phi Mac thing is 11 AX. You're going to see that. But people forget and go to the website. Go to the Wi Fi Alliance website. Go under certifications. Go under programs and look at the stuff. And I guarantee there's a lot of good information. How many people here are flying home today or tomorrow? Print this stuff out and read it on the flight. There's nothing else to do. So a lot of good stuff. Take advantage of it. How am I doing for time? I'm done. All right. Any questions on the Wi-Fi lines? Yeah. I, 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 yes. I'm sure there have some questions. So we uh, have Q&A. The first one is that as you, you have two roles. You're uh, product management at yes. AirHive, as well as you represent AirHive within the Wi-Fi Within the Wi-Fi lines, yeah, triple yeah. So is there a, not knowing how, how this process works, you mentioned a whole bunch of different pieces. They're all rolled up into Wi-Fi 6, which is a great marketing term. As a product manager, do you get to pick and choose which of those are included in Arrowhive APs? That's, yeah, that's it. Wi-Fi 6 is just a certification for 11AX, and it requires WPA3 to be part of it. All the other ones are independent, and the majority of them are optional. That's the tough part because, I mean, I, there are some people within vendor organizations such as mine that their entire job is to attend Wi-Fi Alliance meetings. That's it because there's probably 40 or 50 different work groups because most of these organizations have or most of these um, committees have a, a marketing task group and a technical task group that do different things. And there's probably 50 meetings a week. I'm right now, me personally, in my my Arrowhive hat on, I attend just about every one of the AX technical and marketing ones I could and the security ones, the WPA, the security ones I can. I sit in on the Vantage. Uh, Hotspot um, is, is, come, is being an improvement. Um, there's a lot of them. You can't sit in all of them. But to your point, it's like, what ones do we need to be aware of that if I'm not aware of it, can bite me in the butt, either competitive or something like that in the future. So it's, that's the biggest challenge. I mean, an example I was talking to somebody else before, I uh, had somebody in a company um, come up to me a while back and say, do we support Vantage too? And it's like, uh, no. Um, well, this other vendor does, and they mentioned it on an RFP. I guess we need to support it too, huh? OK. You know, so then we actually got to go through and go through the certification to do that. But some of this stuff, um, once again, it's important to understand that there's a lot of good features in it, but there's, there's no way you can probably get everything certified. Um, once again, there's probably and so, 30 so different you, certifications. You don't, you so what's important to us? The, the reason I bring that up is back to the grandmother example. Grandmother shows up at a hotspot. Yeah. She says, I just bought a Wi-Fi 6 client. Yeah. It's a Wi-Fi 6 hotel. Yeah. But I don't have OWE. You don't have OWE. You don't have enhanced open. So that's. So, so that, that feature of, oh, it's going to be easy for grandma isn't easy for grandma. 
Well, as long as they, they'll probably have an open network or they'll probably just have authentication and they won't have any security on it at that point. So it, it's got to be simple. But once again, and different properties, once again, are going to decide what's appropriate for them. Um, give a little bit of a shout out to something else. There's another organization out there called HTNG, Hospitality Technology Next Generation. And they're large properties, they're vendors, they're service providers and stuff that says, what type of Wi-Fi do I want? And they try to do best practices. They don't do standards. And one of the work groups they're working on right now, and I forget who mentioned it yesterday, is how to define the guest experience. And that's with properties involved, not just techies involved, because I know people hate it heard this way, but sometimes good enough is good enough. You know, whether you like it or not, um, you know, not every property is going to do the same thing. You know, what Marriott believes, what Omni believes, what um, Hilton believes, Best Western believes is different things. And, you know, if, if you're a, I don't want to say low end property or whatever, you know, I put Wi Fi in the sign, and as long as it comes on, I'm good to go. And others have much, much higher expectations, and those properties that have conference areas have even higher expectations. But as I've said many times at other events, and I'll finish on this, is I've got a favorite hotel when I'm flying out of London by Heathrow Airport that's been G for 12 years. And I was there four months ago, and it's still 70% G only. And don't tell anybody, is it works. And I talked to the manager about three years ago. So it says, every once in a while, comes and somebody comes in and complains about it, and it's an IT guy. It's not somebody just doing their job. You know, so that will say Wi-Fi 3 on it if they implement it. But they don't do conferences. They don't do anything. It's tired business people getting ready to go home, do a little Skype and get out of there. And it actually works. So maybe somebody did a really, really good job deploying an 11G network 10 years ago. And the property saved an enormous amount of money going to A and AC. And maybe they'll make the jump to AX someday. Or maybe they only got a 100 meg uplink and it doesn't matter. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, we can get uh, Alan and...